Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Angie Hunter, and I'm director of the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering at the Royal Academy of Engineering. And I'm very, very pleased uh, to be here today uh, to introduce to you uh, Roger Kemp, uh, Robert Llewellyn, and Tamara uh, Harkness, who are going to be talking about um, how to keep warm. How to keep warm the green way. Okay, thank you very much. I give you that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, we're very grateful to the Royal Academy for sponsoring this event. Uh, I am Tamanda Hartness, indeed. I'm, uh, I'm on the Cheltenham Science Festival Advisory Board, and I have a great interest in engineering, largely because I'm previewing a, what we're calling a working prototype of a new comedy show about engineering, also sponsored by the Academy on Sunday night. Uh, but for now, I'm here to chair a more serious event. We have two great speakers with a very wide range of different perspectives on this question. Uh, so we're going to hear from them first, and then we should have lots of time for you to ask questions, and also if you want to pitch in with your point of view, that would be great as well. I should probably declare my interest beforehand. As I said to the speakers, I'm one of those people that, as long as I can keep warm, I'm happy. And uh, I'm the one that always turns the central heating up as soon as my flatmate goes out. And then he comes back in and turns it down because he's Scottish. So... Uh, <laughs> Sounds like I may be playing devil's advocate a little, but that's fine. You have two expert speakers here. So we're going to start off with Professor Roger Kemp from Lancaster. Uh, oh, no, sorry, we're not. Ah, we spent ages discussing this, and I still got it wrong. It, it, can he cut that bit out of the film? Oh, yes, I should say, actually, the, the Royal Academy uh, is filming this for their own archives. So if anybody is here because you've bunked off work, uh, try to make the back of your head look like somebody else. And if you're here with somebody you shouldn't be here with, just don't hold their hand. Um, but we should be fine. It's only for their website. Uh, so, no, we're going to start off uh, with Robert Llewellyn, whose face is probably familiar to you from programmes like uh, Red Dwarf and Scrap Heap Challenge. Uh, but he said he had a, a moment of epiphany when he was given a ride in an electric car in 2001. And it sounds like since then he's been driving a, a huge range of them. He's got one parked outside, if you're really nice to him then he might, um, he might show you it afterwards. And he's also got a new book out, which is a science fiction novel. So if you're really nice to him, you might be able to go and buy a copy in the bookshop and he'll sign it for you. Uh, but first of all, he's going to speak to us about how we can keep warm and still save the planet. Fire away. Thank you. Uh, gosh, this is agony for me. But then, can we keep warm and still save the world? Obviously, is a very good question. Um, I'm going to let Roger explain the true enormity and complexity of the, the task that's ahead of us. But I'm, so I'm going to try and paint a sort of bigger picture of why we might need to do something to find a way to keep warm and save ourselves, because in the end of the day, the planet can probably look after itself fairly well if, if we weren't here. Um, I do have a bit of a problem with the flippancy of the title of this talk, I have to say. Um, anyone who sets out to save the world is obviously going to be open to derision and ridicule, and in a way, rightly so, because you know, how can any of us save the world? We're not that important. But, However, can we actually keep warm, uh, transport ourselves, live in a civilised, technologically advanced way and not destroy the planet we live on in the process or each other in the pursuit of the diminishing resources that we have? And my argument is it's not easy, but it is possible. And that really is the kind of crux of the whole thing. Uh, we do have to learn how to maintain and, uh, and adapt our civilization as we move towards technologies that essentially don't require us to burn stuff. And this is something I've come to uh, through discussions with engineers and scientists and looking at all the different options that are open to us. If we start to aim towards not burning stuff, we're not going to get there quickly. It's going to take probably hundreds of years. But if that's the aim of the human race is to find ways of using technology, of, using, uh, of, of maintaining our lives, of living in comfort, not living in medieval squalor, uh, the, the less stuff we burn, just by definition, is quite a good thing to aim at. And I'm trying to sort of encourage that as a way of thinking about these things. Do we need to, do, do we need to burn stuff to make this? And, and one of the things that really threw this into uh, very highlighted for me, that must be one of the worst sentences ever, <laughs> threw me into a highlighted for me, 
Uh, I think you know what I mean, uh, was when I saw uh, and, and spoke to a student, a Dutch student, who has devised a way of making glass without burning anything. When you think of glass, you think heat, and you've got to have a massive furnace, and you have to have melt loads of glass, and you need gas, and you need electricity. And he just uses, I mean, I did it as a kid, most boys have killed ants with a magnifying glass, on a pretty big scale. And he uses a 3D printing technology and a box of sand in the Sahara Desert and a massive lens above it, and he moves the box like this underneath the, the lens, and it focuses a beam of the sun's light onto sand, and it melts the sand into glass. Now, this is an experiment. The glass bowl that comes out of it looks like it's been made by a three-year-old in a nursery. It's not sophisticated, but it is possible. It is possible, and there, were, there may be ways that we can look at that and go, wait a minute, this shows us something. This is a we're creating something that we've only ever been able to create by enormous amounts of burning. And here's someone who's doing the same thing without burning anything. So that was a clue. Uh, so I, the, I think the, the, the world is, has changed dramatically in the last 20 years in terms of its it, political discussion. I think the, the politics almost now, globally, is between technological optimists who think we can do something about the, the way we live now and Luddite pessimists who think we're approaching the end of the world anyway. Let's drill more, burn more, let's get more stuff, let's go further, let's go into the Arctic and into uh, weirder and weirder places, and let's scrape up sand and boil it and get some oil out of it. Let's just keep getting oil, no matter what it costs, no matter what the massive cultural and, and environmental damage it does. We've got to have more oil, because there's only one thing that works, and that's burning stuff. We've got to burn stuff. And that, the burning stuff is, I drove here today in a little electric car that is the most ridiculous thing. It looks like an egg box on wheels. It's very comical. It makes other people nearly crash because as you drive past them, they go, <laughs> bloke in an egg box. But all I, what's important is that car this morning was charged purely by solar energy from solar panels on my roof. It didn't burn anything to get here. I drove 26 miles to get here, uh, at not at very great speed, 50 miles an hour is as fast as that little thing will go, uh, but I didn't burn anything. The fact that that's even remotely possible, that I could sit in a little machine and drive 25 miles without burning anything, is, I think, quite remarkable. And I've charged, uh, I've driven over 27,000 miles in electric cars in the last couple of years. A huge amount of that didn't require burning anything. A huge amount of that transportation. So I think I've got, I am, an op I am a technological optimist in that there are technological solutions to a lot of the huge problems we've got. I just want to say one thing about what we think is normal now. We all live like this. I've got a gas boiler at home. It runs on LPG. There's, you know, I'm not special. I haven't gone the whole hog. I don't live in a, a, a subterranean a house that's heated by air source heat pumps. I wish I did, but I don't. Uh, my missus won't let me dig the hole. Um, <laughs> but if we think about what we do now, which is normal, which is we drill a hole in the ground somewhere very, very isolated. We extract gas. We transport that gas along thousands of miles of pipeline. We store that gas in high-pressure tanks. We then put it on ships, and we bring it across the ocean, and then we put it in other high-pressure tanks, and we then feed it into a huge network of pipes, and we then stick it into our houses, and we burn it in one individual little boiler, which heats the water, which warms our house. And then the, all the waste gases are wasted, and that is normal. And it's in exactly the same argument can be said for internal combustion engine cars. So... What is normal now and what we accept as normal and what we accept we have to keep struggling to maintain that supply and we must compromise our politics and we must give Mr. Putin hundreds of billions of dollars a year. We must give the king of Saudi Arabia hundreds of billions of dollars a year out of our economy. This is an economic argument and a political argument as just as much as an environmental one. Um, I think I've probably nearly, I've nearly run out. <laughs> so I just want to tell you some of the things that I've seen recently, because I'm currently making a program about alternative energy and electric vehicles, but very much about renewable and alternative energy. One, two of the most amazing things I've seen recently, one is a kind of, in a sense, a, a gas boiler that is, a, is the equivalent of a hybrid car. So it's a kind of combination of two. So it's a gas boiler, it burns gas, but it has a Stirling engine built into it, and the hot gases run the Stirling engine, the Stirling engine turns a generator. These boilers produce between 1,500 and 2,400 kilowatt hours of electricity a year on the average way that we use boilers now. It doesn't use any more gas, it doesn't increase any other consumption, it just produces electricity with something we already do. And it's those kind of ingenious ideas. Why waste that gas? Every time I walk past where our boiler's in our house and I can see it going, I'm going, what's that doing? You can put your hands above it on a freezing cold day 
and there's loads of heat and gas coming out of that boiler that's doing nothing. And it could be used. And that, you know, those solutions are really important. Now, those gas boilers, guess what? They're more expensive than your standard boilers. Well, it doesn't make economic sense, Bobby. No one's going to buy them. T believe me, 2,400 kilowatt hours of electricity a year makes a difference to your electricity bill just like solar panels, because I did the very simple maths, and Roger will, I'm sure, correct me, but it's very simple maths the other day. My solar panels on my roof have been on just over a year, and I looked at them the other day, and it's 2,702 kilowatt hours in a year, just over a year, they've produced. Uh, with a, with a, a boiler that was also producing electricity, we would produce, in total, say, let's say, uh, 4,000 kilowatt hours a year. Well, the average house, according to um, the government office of energy, I can't remember what they're called, <laughs> off-gen, off-gen, off-gen is 3,300 kilowatt hours a year is the average household consumption of electricity in this country. So each house could produce more electricity than it uses. It's not going to, it's not simple, it's not cheap, but it is possible. And I think that is the important thing. One last thing, do we need massive central generating plants to cover the, the, the electricity that we need to generate it? And I think we need to look at countries like Germany, where I'm going to visit shortly, because they are starting to prove that you don't, really. You need some backup supply. But their electricity generation is now spread over the whole country. Half of all the solar panels in the world are in use in Germany today. They produce over 20% of all their electricity just from solar panels. They're, they're aiming to produce 100% of their electricity from renewables by 2050. No other country is trying to do this. And I think they've got some rather good ideas in Germany, and I think we should see what they're doing, because we are lagging way, way behind. And one last thing. <laughs> one last thing is through. A lot of arguments, people go, well, there's no point me changing, because China, what about China? They're burning loads of gold. It's awful, awful, awful. If you look at the very simple graph of the amount of kilowatt hours per head, per person, that is used, China is so low down on that spectrum, you can barely see it. America is just colossally vast, and the United Kingdom is frighteningly close behind them. So we consume vastly more kilowatt hours per head per year than 90% of the rest of the world. So there's massive discrepancies, and it, we could generate our own and reduce by an insulation and by all those other things, and there's other discussions that will come up, but I've gone on too long now. That's enough. Roger, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Marvellous. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely loads to think about there. And uh, obviously, what do we need to make technological optimism work? We need an engineer, of course. Luckily, we have one here, Professor Roger Kemp from Lancaster University Engineering Department, who's done a variety of very interesting jobs in the past. Uh, but most recently, he, uh, he chaired a report for the Royal Academy of Engineering, which I think he's going to talk about precisely about heat. So, Roger, tell us everything. Thank you. I'd like to start with a graph. This graph shows, on the left, where we get our energy from, on the right, what happens to it. And the really interesting one we want to talk about today is that big grey snake that starts at the bottom left, goes up to the top, that's basically heating. So if we're going to do something dramatic with our carbon dioxide emissions, then heating is one of the most important things we've got to deal with. The other one we've got to deal with, of course, is vehicles, but that's not for today's agenda. Heat is actually one of those complicated things that it's not an average throughout the year. Vast amounts of heat needed, I was going to say in winter, but actually seeing as I was... <laughs> and yesterday. Seeing, seeing as I had heating <laughs> on over the entire weekend. Um, it's needed at certain times, not at other times. And this graph shows 2010, where you can see that in the middle of winter, they were, we were using 300 gigawatts of heat. By the summer, almost nothing. And this is one of the problems, that it's no good saying, let's build something to generate an average amount of heat. We need it when we want it. This is where it comes from. Don't worry too much about the detail, but the blue is gas. The big bar on the left is heating. The next one along is space heating. The next one along is water heating. And just looking at it very quickly, it's gas that we've got to cope with. That's the, that's the big challenge. And this is really what in the academy we sometimes refer to as a trilemma. A dilemma's got two sort of issues. This is a trilemma with three problems. There's a Climate Change Act, an obligation to reduce carbon. There's affordability. 
and the security of supply. We always used to talk about keeping the lights on. I think nowadays probably keeping the television on is more important to a lot of people. And that is the sort of the big problem between these three totally conflicting objectives. Now, you could say, let's just build lots of renewable energy, stick it into heat pumps, get rid of gas boilers. But just doing that without doing anything to the structure of buildings starts becoming expensive. And particularly when you take into account the fact that you're not going to need heat for perhaps six months of an average year or about three weeks of this year, um, <laughs> you then start saying, well, it's quite easy. We just need to build 20,000, 30,000 wind turbines. And um, by the way, we won't use them for most of the summer. Economically, that doesn't make sense. Ideally, we should be building houses to the best standards. And you look at some homes, they're brilliant. In fact, you can keep the entire house warm just by using your computer and by walking up and down stairs to generate a bit of heat. But most of the houses that will be around in 2050 have already been built. So this is not necessarily the solution. Everyone's telling us we've really got to insulate our houses, and of course we have. If we've got a house with cavity walls without insulation in it, or a loft that's easy to insulate, great, let's do it. But how many houses are like that? These are just some of the houses kicking around Lancaster, near where I live, and they've got loft spaces you can't get into, they've got solid walls. It is difficult to deal with um, all houses. So we've got solutions that work to some sort of buildings, but perhaps not to others. Some people have plenty of renewables. I happen to live in a part of the country where most of my neighbours have trees that were planted 30 years ago and are now completely blocking up their garden, so they spend their life cutting them down, so I burn them. <laughs> not everybody is in that fortunate situation. Some people have got south-facing roofs. Great, put in the necessary equipment. But again, this is not a ubiquitous solution. In some continental cities, people are building um, big central boilers where you can burn waste wood, waste, waste uh, materials, in order to make heat for a whole load of places. This one's in Orléans, and it provides heat for 7,500 houses, schools, hospitals, and everything else. This one in Metz, much the same, produces electricity, produces heat, just as, as Robert was talking about at a domestic scale, but it burns mostly um, rubbish. So it's basically a big incinerator as well. Gets rid of the landfill problem, makes electricity, makes heat, keeps houses warm. But we don't have many in Britain. And I could go on for an hour or two about why not. And if people are interested, let's talk about it afterwards. But there's something about Britain that makes this quite a difficult thing to do. We can put better controls in houses. Why are we warming up rooms we don't want? This is my house in Lancaster. The room on the right is a living room above the garage. We only use it in the evening. So we put on a heating a control system that basically doesn't switch it on throughout the day. In the winter, it cools down to about 10 degrees by about 5 or 6 o'clock. Then it comes on. We live in it for the evening. goes off again. Saves about half the energy we would otherwise have used. So there are some excellent ways one can look at saving energy, but the problem is not one will actually suit everybody. A further, further question, which um, I would address to our chair, is what you should wear. We work on the assumption that you should be able to wander around your house summer or winter in, I'll say, a T-shirt to preserve people's modesty. I said um, pants, actually. And that people going into <laughs> shops, offices, or in this case, university laboratories, would expect to wear a T-shirt or a strappy top in winter exactly as they might in summer. Is that really a sensible assumption? Certainly, when I first started work, Aaron's sweaters were the order of the day in the factory I worked in. So, here are just a, a few of the conclusions. Firstly... There is no one-size-fits-all situation. There are thousands of ways of saving energy, using less, but you can't say, we will do this to everything. The list of things I've included there are important. Also important is a fairly heavy base load of zero-carbon electricity, which is renewables or nuclear or whatever choice you happen to make. But there are three quite serious problems. The first is national policy. 
So at the moment, we seem to have a heat policy, we seem to have a transport policy, we seem to have an, energy, an electric, electricity markets policy, we've got a policy that sells off things, buildings that might otherwise use energy. None of these seem to be tied together. So there's an issue over what you might describe as systems thinking within government. Secondly, there's a problem of skills, that it's quite easy to put in a gas boiler. If you size a gas boiler, you go around with a paper and pencil, make a few quick calculations, say, well, it needs about 20 kilowatts, let's add another 30 kilowatt, 30% just to be on the safe side, build it, no real problem. Gas boilers are tolerant. Heat pumps are not tolerant. If you get it wrong, you can spend a fortune on electricity. So to tailor equipment to people's houses is going to need a completely new skill set, which isn't your conventional plumber. And finally, the whole industry needs some sort of sta stability. At the moment, we, we seem to be having regulations, rules, laws that come in, that go out, big subsidies for solar PV, oh, and then they suddenly removed subsidies for this, feed-in tariffs and so on. We do need stability. Heating systems last 20 years, 30 years or more. And to say we will change the rules every time a new government comes in clearly doesn't work. So I suppose in answer to the question that was posed, and I won't go into the semantics about whether or not it's a sensible question, um, <laughs> yes, we can, but it'll not be easy and it'll be quite expensive. <laughs> and quite a lot of the stuff that's in that that I've been talking about actually appears in this book. I have one copy which I'm going to guard with my life, but you can download it from there, or if you speak very nicely to the Royal Academy, they will possibly send you a copy by post. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roger. So there you are. We've got techno optimism on this side, and then we've got the engineer saying, it'll cost you. <laughs> And you'd have to wear a jumper. So plenty to, plenty to get your teeth into there. Um, I'm not going to take up any more time. Actually, the hand's going up already. Uh, what I'm going to do, I hope you two are happy with this, is I'm going to take three or four questions or points, if you just want to get stuck into the debate, that's also fine, from the floor, and then come back to you two so you don't have to feel that you have to answer every point, both of you. Uh, so do we have microphones? OK, two hands have already gone up in the middle, so can we get one microphone to down here? And then afterwards over there, and you, no, 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 you, um, have we got more than one microphone? Yeah, yeah, so you stay this side, because the hand went on this side as well. Yep, there, 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 good, excellent. So, uh, uh, I'll come back to you. No, no, no. Here, here. <laughs> right a bit, left a bit. <laughs> good, okay. Let's start with you, um, and then we'll go over here while we move that microphone across to there. Yeah. Th thank yes. you for your degrees of optimism. I'm quite happy to wear my jumper in the winter, and I'm the sort of thermostat and control police in our house. Um, I have relented in these last few days, though. Um, Roger Kemp, could you please tell us why we haven't got combined heat and power? You did want the question, mm. so I want to know why we haven't got com uh, combined heat and power distributed systems in this country. Okay, if you can hold that thought for a second, I'll get these two questions as well. Yes, so one over here. And if you could get that microphone over to that hand there on the other central block. That one there, yeah. Hello. I'm an engineer, uh, but one of the things that strikes me is that the Royal Academy of Engineering is perhaps looking to engineering solutions. The fashion industry is extremely powerful has anyone done anything about getting loads of fashion designers on board with cuddly clothes? <laughs> That's, if there was a prize, which there should be, for the best use of lateral thinking and audience contribution, I would nominate you for that. I have to say, Vivian Westwood is at the festival at some point, so perhaps you should get into her event and lobby her for designer thermals. Okay, whoever's got that microphone there? Yes, we got the microphone? Yes, I'd like to ask some question on the heat pumps that you gave us some shiveringly um, observations as difficult to get right. Since we're about to put an air-to-air -air heat pump into a public building in this town, I'd like some more information, please. 
Marvellous. Okay, and then we're going to go down right to that person right on the end at the front. Sorry, you're getting still running around here, I realise. Do we have any more questions on this side? While, okay, so yes, that microphone there, if we get that to that person at the back while this microphone makes its way over to you. Are you holding all these in your mind, you two? Of course. Good. Excellent. Absolutely. It's like clear, as, <laughs> clear as mud. Okay. Yes? 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 Yeah, hi. Yes. Um, I don't own my own home. I'm a tenant. Um, now, how do I persuade my landlord who takes, you know, two months to change a bulb in the hall and won't even pay for the grass to be cut that it's worth his while to invest in all of these things which, which seem like sort of no-brainers, really? That's a very good question. And indeed for my generation who... Uh, apparently, none of us are going to own a home before we're about 55 <laughs> or something. Yeah. Violins at the back, please. That's a very good question. I, I should say, though, changing light bulb is not hard, and you could possibly do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean that to sound as mean as it, as it did, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, absolutely, it's a different level. Yes, so gentlemen at the back there, and then we will come back to you too before we forget what all those questions were. Uh, my question relates to the skills deficit that the professor alluded to in terms of our plumbers or existing plumbers. How does he see that being fulfilled, that de deficit, in the short to medium term from our colleges and training providers? Okay, so a lot of very hardcore engineering questions for you there on combined heat and power and uh, skills deficit and the other one, which I can't remember, so I hope you can. I can. Uh, and any questions you'd like to pick up, including and not limited to the fashion one. Who would you like to start? Okay. Right. Let, let me start by, by, by thinking about the CHP problem. If you go to somewhere like Malmo in Sweden, you'll find a, an arrangement where people say, the state will say, we're putting in CHP pipes down the street. Um, you don't have to use them, but after seven years, you'll be paying for them. And you'll be paying for the energy whether you use it or not. In Britain, we have this owner-occupied democracy fetish, and I use that word you know, intentionally, that we work on the basis that an Englishman's home is his castle, and we want competition. Now, you can't do competition if you've got pipes in the street. You're basically looking for a monopoly supplier. And it tends to be a monopoly supplier that, in most countries, is a, a national organisation. We don't do nationalisation, we do private sector. Also, if you've got a CHP system, you need a central core user. And if you listen to the, read the government's reports on this subject, they're talking somewhat naively about schools, government offices, hospitals, universities and so on, being core users of CHP systems. Another part of the government is busy privatising all those services. So, basically, it isn't a question of engineering. It's a question of politics. It's a question of saying, if we want to get this right using CHP, then we have to have the sort of... Um, am I allowed to use the word socialised? Um, <laughs> Socialist-type um, solutions that don't appeal to the free market ethos of the country. And I think that is, that is the key problem. And happy to discuss that, but I require beer to... Go into it in more detail. <laughs> <laughs> Ground rules, very good. Uh, sorry, heat pump, that was the other question. I right, the heat pump question, uh, in this book, which I strongly recommend having written it, um, <laughs> we refer, well, I didn't do very much research ourselves, actually. We sort of looked at what lots of other people had done. And we cite two reports, two quite big and very, very well done reports, looking at the way that some heat pumps have been installed quite often they're put in totally the wrong type of houses. That a heat pump does not give you the 30 kilowatts output that a gas boiler does. If you've got the sort of lifestyle that says, I'm out all day, I come in at 6 o'clock in the evening, I want the heating on for a couple of hours, and then I go out to the pub, and then I go to bed, and I don't want it on until next evening, then a heat pump isn't for you. Heat pumps are great if you say, I want a steady 2, 3, 4, 5 kilowatts on, day in, day out. So there's a lifestyle question. Is it really, do you really have the right lifestyle for the type, that type of um, heating system? Then there's a question about insulation, that to use a heat pump effectively, you need a long thermal time constant in the building, which means either you have to make it very heavy, 
or you have to make it with a, a lot of insulation between the mass of the building and the outside. So again, do you have a building that's the right sort of building? And how do you eventually control it? We saw some evidence of people who were using heat pumps put in by their local council because they were sheltered accommodation. The users didn't have a clue really what to do with them. The controllability was dire. So the only way they could keep their bedrooms to a reasonable temperature was to open the windows at night. So there you have the heat pump busy with churning away, generating heat. And uh, people opening the windows let it go out into the outside world. So, yes, it's a technology that can work, but it needs to be applied intelligently and it needs to be applied appropriately for the sort of people who live in the building and the building. And that really brings me on to this question about um, the skill base. Now, there are some groups... Um, of heating engineers, plumbers, who are basically upskilling their profession. It's no longer how do we install a boiler, it's how do we actually install a boiler, is it better to install a boiler or solar heating or heat pumps, what are the trade-offs, how do we do those calculations? And a number of firms of plumbers and heating engineers are doing that. Our local firm of plumbers and heating engineers couldn't work out how to put in a second time clock on a motorised valve so I said, look, I'll buy the thing, I'll put it there, you, you plumb it in, and then I'll wire it up. Now, that is not an option for the majority of householders, I suspect. <laughs> so either one can start with the existing plumbing base and say, how do we then improve the ability of that base to actually look at all these new technologies and come up with a sensible combination of them? Or alternatively, we say, where do we recruit a group of heating professionals from, who would be people who would have, would have gone to the technical colleges that were turned into universities by John Major's government, or the colleges of technology or whatever. And it may well be that they're then going to be produced by, um, in the future, some of the new technology colleges. But as a country, we again seem to have shut down our production of that type of technical skill and... I honestly don't know where we're going to get this, the um, resources from. But the Academy has written another report about it. <laughs> so go on our website and, and read it. I, I've heard there's people, there's students, who can't even change a light bulb. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Have they done a risk Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to throw something at me now. <laughs> no, I'm a pacifist. What about the landlord? Yes, what about the landlord question? Are you, are you able to comment on that? <coughs> As a, I feel, as feel a uniquely homeowner. unable to comment on anything, really. Uh, the, um, uh, the, I mean, the only argument that you could have with a landlord was, uh, you, you, you know, you're, you charge this much rent and you spend this much uh, on energy, on heating your house, and, and, and you could spend this much. You could charge this much rent and only spend this much on heating, your, heating the house. You're an idiot, you know. <laughs> You're wasting money. You're a numpty. Spend 10,000 quid now. Insulate the place properly. Make the walls warmer. You know, improve it. Put solar panels on the roof. You're, you will pay less energy bills over the next 20 years. Try and have a slightly longer-term view than the next month. Because I think, I mean, I absolutely agree with everything you've yeah. said, but I think it is the, the, the curse we're under is what do politicians have a five-year plan? Never more than that. We need a 50-year plan. We need a 100-year plan. Thankfully, there are some need, engineers need and scientists a thinking... Year. Or a 200-year plan. That we, you know, <laughs> and, and people like landlords have a month-long plan. You know, I can think about ahead of month. When do I get the rent next? A month. One month, you know. <laughs> well, maybe think, like, go really crazy and think five years. Because in five years, you could save 10 grand. If you explain it to him, you could save 10 grand. You keep paying the same rent. He'll have more money, which will make him feel better. I don't know how else to do it. I could do it with puppets, if you like. <laughs> I think the, 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 the other part of the problem is a lot, lot of my friends who have rented houses, the landlord pays for the insulation... The tenant pays the, pays the gas bill. That yes. was, yeah, that's what I was about to and, say. I mean, I'm exactly that position. And that type that's of true. structure yeah. where they have absolutely no incentive again comes back to mm. politics. Yeah. Yeah, yes, the tenants, if, if, yeah, if, if, it's the same if, with us. That we, we, pay the, we pay the gas and electric bill. The landlord yeah. would have to pay to put the insulation in. Yeah. Um, so there's absolutely nothing for him to gain by doing that. No, it is. I mean, I think we're going to see this more and more extremely because I certainly, I mean, my experience is in France where, you know, I, I, my mates parents who were really wealthy people who collected paintings didn't own a house and and coming from where i came from that was like they're weird 
they don't even own a house. They must be really poor. Oh, yeah, they actually had a Monet in the front room. You know? <laughs> no, they weren't really poor. They were stinking rich. They lived right on the Jardin de Luxembourg in Paris. But they didn't own a house because why would you? And their rent, as I now remember, included, included their electricity and heating. It was all in one payment. And so it was up then it, with slightly different legislation. And I bet their rent was high. It wasn't cheap. But what slightly different legislation, it would mean that the landlord would go, Mon Dieu. <laughs> <laughs> I am costing the earth. Quick, insulation! I don't know what the French for insulation is. Insulation. Insulation, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> hang, hang on, hang, hang on. on, I will get the microphone to you in a second. Did you want to say anything about fashion? Fa I haven't got a clue about fashion. There is a ghastly product in America that I've had a go in, which is it's, it's called something like a snuglet or a. It is the most. What's it called? Snug, is it, it's basically a big a hu, a human waist sack. You just get in it, and it's got sleeves. It's just one big fluffy bag, and you sit in front of the telly and just eat. And, it, and you can just get bit, and it will stretch. It will go until you just are vast. You don't ever have to move. You don't get cold. You could live in sub-zero temperatures and eat. And as long as your telly works and you're, you're in your bag... You can live not, in a block of ice. It's not really an advert for it's not dressing the, I, to I tried more. walking to the loo in it, and I got in a right mess. <laughs> still, at least you were still so walking. So I don't know anything yes. about... I think wearing more clothes. I mean, I, my <laughs> wife is Australian. The only things we've done right when we did our house up, we did everything wrong, and, and the way we brought up our children, everything we did wrong. <laughs> and we fell in love with each other, and we come from different continents on the other side of the earth. You couldn't get it wronger. But the only thing we did righter was we insulated our house, and we insulated our house way, way above the sort of standard minimum and it's made an enormous difference and we actually did have the heating on last night uh, and, uh, and when I say my wife's Australian it's relevant because her average comfortable body temperature is about 38 degrees centigrade between like 38 and 50 already. you know that's where she's comfortable so anything below that means that means that the house is stag and I have walked around in shorts and a t-shirt with a, with a peak cap on in the winter because the light's so bright and it's so hot I can't cope <laughs> um, but we gradually eased it down. But our heating bills have been slashed in half by insulating. Triple glazed windows, doors that when you shut them, they go, Zoom! they shut. There's no breeze coming through. It was expensive. It cost a lot of money. I was really depressed when we did it. I, it made me, I was riddled with anxiety. You know, I mean, it was a horrendous job doing all that. And the insulation in the roof is so thick that there's no roof left. We just had loads of insulation left, so we just put it all up there. So it's about, honestly, it's about that thick. But that means that the, the house is incredibly warm all year round with very, very little heating. And it does, you know, it, uh, we were lucky because our house is a wooden structure. So the walls were originally that thick. They're now that thick. And that is insulation. We've gone completely bananas with it. So it is... But it's made a tremendous difference. Absolutely. Um, if we have a log, we've got a wood-burning fire. If we light that like we do at Christmas, we have doors open. And I'm not joking. It is so hot in the house, it's unbearable. You just can't be in there. So, you know, that, if, if from now on, this, I mean, this is, I think, going along very much with what you were saying, that our legislation, if there was actual legislation, as there is in crazy communist European countries like Germany... Um, that you, you know, if you build a new house, one, it has to have a, have a south facing roof. Two, that whole roof has to be solar panels. Three, it has to be insulated beyond the, the dreams of man. I went to a house called the One Ton House in Stockholm, which is unbelievable. One ton house means it releases one ton of CO2 per year. Now, I don't know what the average is in here, it's about two and a half thousand or something. Mm. It is off the scale. So this house is just unbelievable, but it's the most, it's very Swedish. It's like walking into IKEA land. A family of four live in it. They have an electric car, of course, uh, and it has solar panels. In Sweden, where, you know, there's a lot of snow, it's incredibly warm. There's n they don't burn anything to heat it. The whole way it's run, it, you know, it shows it can be done. I and mean, that was really my argument. Yes, it's going to take a long time. Yes, it's going to be expensive, but we can do it. So you could live in a very, very warm house just in your pants and not have a boiler <laughs> and, you know... In fact, Sounds take good. your pants off. Why bother? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, maybe that was, I was just, just a bit too far. I, I was just thinking, oh, everything you need to do is marry an Australian. <laughs> That's my problem solved. Right, I can see loads of hands going up. Uh, we want to get as many people in as we can. There's two very keen hands going in. It. So we'll start with a gentleman at the back who can barely contain himself and then come <laughs> forward to the gentleman a bit further forward. On this side, yes. we've got hands near the back there and then we will come in and get you guys as well. So, yes. This is just a comment about the landlord-tenant situation. 
that there is legislation coming forward that landlords will have to upgrade the uh, thermal performance of buildings uh, before they can let them. I'm not sure of the date. It might be tw uh, 2018, so it's still a few years <laughs> ago. But the, the problem time. is understood <laughs> and something's been done about yeah. it, probably not enough. There you go. Well, well there's a partial answer yeah. for you, although depressingly, it'll come into force about the time when you can afford to buy a place and rent it out. So, uh, and yes, yeah, if you'd like to move that forward, and while you're doing that, yes. Um, hi. Uh, Robert, you mentioned Swedes. I'm glad you did. Um, Fana Grand Designs and Kevin McLeod talks about Swedes a lot because they have, you know, triple glazed windows and this really brilliant glass and all this stuff. What I want to know is, I don't think that's legislation. I think the Swedes just do it. I want to know both your opinions on the British public, actually, from what you've seen, from your individual roles in what you do about, um, and whether are we just a bit rubbish and apathetic about it. Are we just going to sit back and expect legislation to want us to do what we need to do? And also from when you've been uh, either travelling or your knowledge, is which is the best country for actually doing it off their own back for getting really good houses that are... Okay, low so on carbon. Okay. Save up that chance to really slag off British people and your audience. Uh, gentleman there in the blue shirt, yes. So I will come to you as well. And meanwhile, uh, that hand there you can't see just by the pillar. Yeah. Yes. It was being advocated that our long term aim should be to burn nothing. Did you include in that biofuels, wood, bioethanol, and so on? And could you explain why not? Okay, being called on your wood-burning stove, I think. Oh, yeah. uh, yes, lady just there. I think possibly for offices and certainly for houses, it would be nice to have a clock that showed you what you were using of both electricity and gas together. And if possible, put money terms on it. <laughs> yeah. Both for economy, you know, in heat and also in money terms. It would be nice to know whether you should use the grill or the oven, whether you should live with a hot water bottle or the heating. And there are alternatives that are quite difficult to suss out on your own. So something between a smart meter and a cash register. Yes. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Very concrete suggestion. I'm yes, on the front questions. row there. Oh. Hello. Um, I'm blind, so... Please forgive me if you already said on the slide, but um, you said about uh, this car that drove without burning fuel. And I'm just wondering, like, how is that possible? Because Maybe it's an electrically powered car, but there's an uh, electricity generation usually more burning modes of viewers. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we'll take those questions and then we'll come back because I realise there are more hands. Would you two like to... Do you want to slack off the Swedes first? The Swedes, yes. Now, the Swedes are lovely. They're all gorgeous. Because um, uh, I can't quite remember what it was, how you, but, but, uh, you were saying. I, I think that the, uh, the, the way Swedes do things, why don't we do things? I mean, I think that, that, that let's... I'm going to make the, the jump that Swedish people are quite well educated and they have looked at the... Um, long-term prospects of the energy market. They're a very small market. I think, what, three or four million people living in Sweden. It's not, a, it's not anything like as big a country in terms of uh, the population as here. Uh, the, I've spent a lot of time with Volvo cars there. The way they think about cars is very different to the way we do. The way they think about car ownership is very different to the way we do. The way they think about home ownership is very different to us. They understand that we are coming to the end of a very long period of cheap, abundant energy. We've had coal in our own backyard. We've had oil that cost pence per barrel. We've had natural gas, natural gas, I love that term, that was in our own sea. And we got it out there as quickly as we could and we used it. We had big rovers. Whoa, I'm a man in a rover and I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and we burnt that stuff by the trillions of barrels. For the last 60, 70 years, we had some massive wars. We used a few trillion barrels in that. 
We're used to it. It's normal. It's what makes us comfy. It all works. We can now drive to the garage and get fuel. We can just turn on the tap, and that water's hot because we've got the gas. It comes from Russia. And, don't have and those things are going... You know, no matter what anyone says, no matter what the Republicans say, that we'll just drill more and there's tons more gas. I even have a very good friend in America who believes that the tectonic plates are shifting, and that is creating more oil as that takes place because oil isn't a fossil fuel, and it's all a liberal conspiracy uh, foisted on them by a Muslim president who wants to crush the Americans' freedom to drive a pickup truck. So we have to accept that these resources are going to do two things, not in our, any of our lifetimes or even our children's lifetimes, but in our grandchildren's lifetimes, run out. That means there won't be any gas. So it doesn't matter how efficient our boiler is, it's not going to work unless you fart into it. You know, that's the only choice. And so surely a longer-term view, and that's what I get the feeling from people in Sweden, that, they're, 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 that a lot more people are taking a longer-term view in, and in a very Swedish way and going, for my grandchildren, I want to have a house that is still warm in 200 years' time, as it is today for me when I have the free and very cheap natural resources that I can take out of the ground. Soon we won't be able to do that, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So when you actually look at IKEA furniture, I don't think that has a massive long-term view, but... Um, <laughs> That might be another thing. So, I, you know, that, that is, the, I think, the, it is an educational thing. It is an overarching educational thing that I think goes hand in hand with legislation. That if there's public pressure, that people are going, really, we need to sort this out. Really, we do need to talk about this. We need, I want to have a south-facing roof on my house with solar panels because it does make a difference. And the more that's in the ear, in the ear of the politicians and in the ether, it's in the discussion in general, the general population, then politicians of all colours will go... <laughs> Damn, going to have to bloody do something about that. <laughs> you know, one hopes, one prays that that is the case. I mean, certainly. But I mean, I think it, the, the one last thing I would say is, it, 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 having spent a lot of time in America, we're better off. We're kind of in between America and Sweden. So in America, it is absolutely drawn on party lines. If you vote Republican, you want to drill and scrape oil out of sand and dig stuff up and cut down trees and run pipes everywhere. And if you're a wishy-washy, lefty, liberal Californian tosser like Tom Cruise... No, not Tom Cruise. Who's the other one? George Clooney. Lovely George. He's gorgeous. <laughs> then you want to have wind turbines and electric cars. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's that sort of... And it's completely divided. And then actually, in this country... Both uh, shades of government in the last 20 years have been equally shit, but, but kind of agreeing with each other that we do actually probably have to do something about the way we use fuel. Do you want to make some kind of response to burning things, including clarifying about the car that yes. you burn anything? The burning thing thing, I think, I mean, I, I think, it, I think it, all I'm saying is it, it should be a target. It's going to take an incredible amount of ingenuity and new technology we don't even know about yet, new materials we don't even know about yet, to achieve it. It may not be achievable. But to have it as a target to aim towards is what I'm really talking about, rather than, you know, a, suddenly a law gets in, you can't burn anything. We all live in, you can't, I want to light a match. You know? you know, I don't mean it like that, but I mean, it is a, it is a, if it's an aim to try and get to a place where we burn very, very little, I think that, was, that is... You know, an admirable aim that the human race in general should, should aim at. And as regards the, the electric car, it, an electric car can be powered by electricity that comes from numerous sources. So I'll just name a few hydro, nuclear, which, you know, not nuclear because that does burn stuff, hydro, solar, wind, just for example, could charge an electric car, which is what I was talking about, an electric car, and that electric car can drive along. So it's possible. It's, very, it's still, at the moment, rare, extreme, difficult, awkward, but it's not impossible. That was the point I was trying to make. Thank you. I think what would you like to... Uh, I'd like to add two, two points to that. Firstly, in, electric cars are brilliant in that they have storage. And in the future, we're likely to find that a lot of our electricity generating systems generate when the, when the weather wants us, wants us to have electricity that when the wind blows, when the sun shines, when the tides go out, when the phases of the moon are correct, or whatever, then we get electricity. So an electric vehicle that you can charge up and say, I'll charge it, or your computer will say, let's charge it between 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the morning on Mondays, because that's a time when the tide's going out, so the seven barrage is working, then that will be great. Heating is a bit different, because heating, you tend to want it when you want it. And this, I think, is one of the big differences and one of the important, important reasons for trying to bring together your transport policy and your heating policy. 
because to put in a lot of heat pumps and a lot of electric heating without at the same time being able to use electricity at the times when you don't want heat is going to make things very uneconom uneconomically attractive. So I think the, the electric car is an excellent way of going forward to use those, what is basically free electricity, once you've paid for the capital cost. And this is going to totally change the way we look at electricity. Rather than paying per kilowatt hour, we might end up just having to pay by capacity or by the peak load we take, rather than by every single kilowatt hour. So I think there's a, there's a lot... There can be a lot of changes in the way the electricity market works. In terms of Sweden, um, I used to go there quite regularly. And in winter, you could guarantee that inside was a nice warm temperature, outside was minus 20 or minus 30 or something. And therefore, you know what you're dealing with. Trouble is, in somewhere like Manchester... Sometimes, even in the middle of winter, February, you find it's a nice warm day. So, so we don't have the same incentive to say, I will really insulate my house because I know that for three months in the year, it is going to be really cold. Whereas if you're in a country that is northern Europe, more of a continental climate, you've got a far better idea as to what you're going to have to live with. And I think we have a, a problem in Britain that... We never quite know whether it's going to be cold or hot, whether we're going to need air conditioning on in March, as I think we did, some of us did last, last March, whether we're going to need heating on in the middle of June. And so it becomes a bit more difficult to know how you plan your heating. Insulation is good, but particularly in the damp western coast part of Britain, you've got to have um, air movement, you've got to have fresh air, you've got to have means of getting heat in and heat out. And all that becomes much more difficult to do than trying to arrange good insulation and good heating in somewhere like Siberia, where it's very dry for, for an awful lot of the year, but also very, very cold. Yeah, if we could only find a way to get power from the rain, then Britain's power problems would be over, wouldn't they? OK, we've, we've almost run out of time. We've got about five minutes left. So I want to try and get everybody else in who wants to speak. But I'm going to ask you to be concise. Whoa, and the hands go up. OK, so I'm going to focus on the middle section. So there was a hand there near the back. It's lady just on this side in the middle section. While we're just waiting for that, can I just very quickly say about rain? Yes, Because do. Uh, one of the best installations I've seen it was in an old Saxon mill, which was a hydroelectric plant. It runs the, generates all the electricity for a village in Dorset all year round, not, not reliant on wind. And they had, the people who did this are a part of an organisation and there are something around 7,000 sites like it on rivers existing already. They already exist. They were all Saxon mills. Uh, they, this place generates 440,000 kilowatt hours a year. You can't see it, you can't hear it, it doesn't affect the fish. There, there are so many solutions that are emerging. And these, this is an existing site. No, you, know, you don't have to suddenly change everything and... The local residents are going, oh, no, he's going to change the natural flow of the river. They did actually put fish through it, and I've seen the video of them. When they came out the other side, they went like that. <laughs> and then they carried on swimming. They were dizzy, because they'd just done that down a big, huge turbine that you couldn't see. So, but they weren't, they weren't uh, sushi, basically. <laughs> Sorry, that, just wanted to say that. So rain is, we, we, so we, we have power. every opportunity to use the power of rain. Rain power is the future. OK, so we'll start with you. And if we have another microphone, if we get that down to the front here, ready. Something like a quarter of households are known to turn off their heating in the winter. The situation is only going to get worse, as I understand it, as prices rise. Has the Royal Academy not only looked at sort of solutions, technical solutions, to the problem of people keeping warm and well in their homes, as well as thinking about how politically we can deal with this? Government schemes are coming and going, uh, free offers of insulation come and go, but the crisis goes on and it is very, very serious. And I think I would welcome any thoughts you'd got on how we can tackle this through redistribution of income, making it free to make homes better insulated. What, what can we do? Because we have a crisis which is obviously only going to get worse. Thank you. Yeah, very serious point of people who can't afford to keep even warm enough for health in the winter. Uh, so, yes, down to you. And then if you'd like to pass that microphone down to there, ready. Yeah. Yes, uh, first point, there are 
aren't any chartered engineers in the Houses of Parliament, in, in the Commons now. Um, and I used to live in a, an old Edwardian house, large, fairly large, uh, and some, with a cavity. Somebody in a similar house had the cavity filled, and shortly after, a couple of years later, they had dry rot. Um, and also, uh, if you talk about turning radiators off in some of the rooms, with a large house, you get, it's like a climate, you get condensation in, the, in some of the rooms and so on. Uh, uh, one final point. Um, air heat pumps are very sensitive when the temperature is down. Just when you need these, it's not there. OK, thank you. Skeptical words from an engineer, and then, yes, just... Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'd just like to make a comment about the nuclear uh, story. We're continually bombarded with this story that nuclear electricity is pretty much carbon-free. The production of the electricity in a nuclear plant is uh, low carbon at production, but the actual extraction of the ore and the purification of the fuels is anything but carbon uh, low. So um, where are we going to go as far as nuclear fuels are concerned? Okay, thank you for that. Um, anyone else that wants to speak, um, put your hands up now and I'll try and get you in. Over there at the back. Uh, no? okay. a, a couple of uh, points. I wonder whether somebody would like to comment on the variability of the energy supply. Um, the, obviously, therefore, one needs to find a way of storing it. Two good ways of storing it are batteries and hydrogen. Batteries uh, are very heavy, which is the reason why electric cars are useless and will never make it much of a penetration. <laughs> but on the other hand, batteries in houses don't have to be light because they won't move and they could be an energy source or alternatively hydrogen, which could then perhaps be used in transport. Would you like to comment on those thoughts? Marvellous. OK. Well, I'm going to come back to our speakers now. Uh, wait, we've got about two minutes left. So oh yeah, I'd like you to both briefly answer all those points and give boom, us boom, your, boom. your final thoughts, if, if that's OK. OK. Would like um, you like to go first? Could I talk about batteries? Because that's, that's the last question. In, in this book, we calculated the size of a battery you would need to replace the coal pile at a, at a coal-fired power station. And if you take a two gigawatt power station, which is a fairly normal sort of size of a coal station, um, the battery, if you wanted it to store a month's output, which is the sort of thing you need if you're going to have a, a long period of anticyclonic weather in the middle of winter, the battery would weigh 20 million tonnes and cost <laughs> billions of pounds. So in terms of battery storage, it's great for relatively short-term storage, a day or two, of a relatively limited amount of power to drive a car. It can't pr provide the sort of storage that you need to keep the grid afloat during a three-week period of anticyclonic weather when the wind turbines aren't working. There's a huge problem with storage. My view would be that gas is actually one of the best ways of storing energy. That the gas pipes, lots of compressed gas, so to have devices that <coughs> burn gas when it's needed but use photovoltaics, use wind, use anything else at other times, is clearly a good way forward in energy terms, but it's expensive. And I think that comes on to this question of fuel poverty. Personally, and this is probably going to be provocative, I don't believe there is such a thing as fuel poverty. Mm. I think there is poverty, and poor people can't afford to heat houses, they can't afford a lot of things. But to say we've got to address this by keeping energy costs down is wrong, I'd suggest what we ought to be doing is finding a way of reducing poverty, whether through taxation, redistribution or whatever else, rather than trying to say, and this means we've got to keep energy costs down. I, Thank you. I mean, I, uh, that was the, the point I wanted to make. Was that when I was a, a, a student age man, there was a, a theatre group in this country, a government-funded theatre group called 784. And 784 stood for the idea and the argument, and it was a left-wing argument, that 7% of the UK population owned 84% of the wealth. And that was a shocking figure. You know, they'd have 784 and they'd have posters with clenched fists and red flags. And it was, it's outrageous that, that that few people own that. The present ratio is 492. 4% of the population of this country own 92% of the wealth. That might be wrong. And that might be one reason why there are old people in houses on their own 
cold in the winter, and I think we all need to do something about that. <laughs> and the fact that the most recent statistics have given the top 1% of British executives a 12% pay rise when no one else gets an extra penny means that why aren't we on the streets screaming our f off, excuse my French. <laughs> well, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I did not expect this engineering event to end on this note. But uh, <laughs> all I can suggest, people of Cheltenham, is that you follow Roger and Robert out, um, follow the red flag out to the, <laughs> probably to the bookstall at the back uh, and or if there's a bar outside, if you ply <laughs> Roger with beer he will have an argument with you about combined heat and power. <laughs> and, uh, and I think we all owe a big vote of thanks to the Royal Academy of Engineering for this um, really splendid, provocative and informative event. Uh, thank you all very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. <laughs>